Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Asus Tough Gaming Z690 Plus D4 motherboard. Now, uh, at the time of shooting this video, the Wi Fi version of this board tends to go for around 300 US dollars. Uh, the non Wi Fi version, I'm not sure, but that should generally be a bit cheaper, though it's a bit harder to find from what I can see. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I'd say. That's, you know, $300 is a bit much, considering the feature set that this board has, but, you know, let's get into it. So, uh, starting off with the rear I.O., where you get some display outputs for the iGPU, six USB Type-A ports. This is one of my bigger complaints for this board, is, like, there's space right there. They could have added two more USB ports, you know? Like, just saying. <laughs> I really like there's plenty of space. They could have had two more USB ports. Um, on the other on the other hand, while you don't get that many type A's, you do get two type C's, which is kind of a unique feature in this sort of price range for Z690 motherboards. Not many motherboards do that. So if that's something you're looking for, then that is worth considering. Uh, there's also two and a half gig Intel LAN, which is standard for most Z690 motherboards. Like, some of the really cheap ones will be using Realtek, but, uh, yeah, like, to, like, honestly, you can even find some down in the, like, $220 price range that'll still be on the Intel 2.5 gig, um, and then Intel Wi-Fi 6, and that just depends on if you get a motherboard with or without Wi-Fi, uh, and then the standard set of audio outputs, including an optical out. So, yeah, that's the rear I.O., and, like, my main complaint for it is just, like, there's space for two more USB ports. Like, it's just kind of there. And I know, like, that... And lots of people point out, technically, you can get a dongle to convert Type-C into more USB ports, but it's like, I am spending $300 on the motherboard already. I don't want to go and have to buy an accessory to, like, fill in a gap of the feature set of the motherboard when it's $300. Um, so in my opinion, it should just sort of come with those extra USB ports, but yeah, if you don't find that, you know, if you don't find that, uh, an issue, then obviously you can just kind of ignore my complaints on that. Anyway, let's move on to the internal connectors. Uh, you get four M.2 slots. You get one over here, uh, one over here, and then two hiding under the M.2 slot cover over there. Um, this is a pretty standard number of M.2 slots for a Z690 motherboard to have. Uh, you also get a, well, and then you get your, for, that's moving on to the PCIe slots there. I'm very good at going from one topic to another. Uh, so you get your Gen 5 PCIe slot over here that's connected directly to the CPU. Also, this PCIe, this M.2 slot is connected to uh, the CPU as well, but that one's just Gen 4 because the CPU only has four uh, well, only has 16 Gen 5, uh, Gen 5 lanes, and so all of, like, the, so the extra M.2 slot, well, that doesn't get to be Gen 5, that's just Gen 4. Anyway, other than that, we also have this 1x PCIe slot, which I am not entirely sure why Asus bothered including, because if you install a 2-slot GPU, you're not going to be able to use that. If you install a 3-slot GPU, you're not going to be able to use that or this, um, this being a 4x PCIe slot connected to the chipset. So I really do question the decision to even just have that there. Um, though it is worth noting that unlike some other motherboard manufacturers, Asus did a pretty good job of like moving the M.2 slots away from the GPU PCIe slot. So you might find that your M.2, like that might help M.2 drive thermals depending on how power hungry the GPU you have and you know how much of the heat it dumps onto the motherboard. Um, so that's probably why they went with this PCIe slot arrangement. Though, I'd like, they, they could have technically kept the M.2 slot out of the way of the GPU and just ditched these, because, like, I don't know how you're... Like, the, the, the X4 is arguable. There's still some dual slot GPUs out there, but the X1 is just like, I don't know why that's there. Like, there's no way anybody's going to be able to use that if they have a GPU. So... Anyway, you get an X1 over here. I actually would have, what I would have done is I would have switched these around, right? Get, get, put the bigger big, bigger slot further away from the GPU. Um, anyway, and then you get an X4, like, well, a full length X4 connected to the chipset as well. Um, there's a clear CMOS jumper right over there. You shouldn't really have to use it. The auto recovery on this motherboard has, in my experience, been very solid so far. So, um, yeah, like, 
the the one time you would have to use it is if you load in settings that are just barely unstable enough that you can get into the BIOS and then like not save any changes. And I've had that happen. Like I'd have memory settings where it's like I can get into the BIOS. I can't save and reset though because it'll crash the moment you try to change any settings. Um, and it, in that case, the auto recovery does fail, and so that's that's when you'd have to use that jumper. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, you shouldn't really have to use that very often. Um, you do only get four SATA ports, which, like, I know SATA ports aren't that popular these days, but the vast majority of Z690 motherboards has six SATA ports, and this has four. Um, I feel like they really could have taken the plastic that they used over here for that useless PCI slot and given you four more SATA ports instead, but, uh, yeah, um... Uh, no, you, you just get four, four SATA ports, um, and the space that would have on other motherboards been occupied by more SATA ports is occupied by RGB. Um, so great priorities there, Asus. Anyway, uh, you also get an internal Type-C header over here, so if you have a case with a front panel Type-C connector, you, you can use that. Uh, and then there's some color-coded troubleshooting LEDs over there. Um... And, uh, yeah, that's kind of it for the functionality on this board. And, like, there is a lot of M.2 slots on this board, um, but that's kind of standard for Z690 motherboards. Like, you really don't need to look too hard to find... Like, actually, I'd say most Z690 boards have four M.2 slots. Um, so, yeah, that's not really a unique feature. I think, really, the only thing that's kind of special about this board in this price range is the two Type-Cs in the back. Everything else is just kind of like, yep, there's plenty of other boards that do that too, and some of them arguably have better PCIe slot arrangements, um, though it depends on how big your GPU is. Anyway, um, let's move on to the power delivery. So, for power delivery, you do get an 8 plus 4 pin power connector set up. You can just ignore the extra 4... Like, if your power supply doesn't have the necessary connectors to plug in that extra 4 pin, don't worry about it. The great thing about 12th gen CPUs being manufactured on the new Intel 7 uh, manufacturing process is that they pull less power than their predecessors. Um, and Asus is using the high current variant of the 8 pin power connector. Um, right, you can see that the pins are all nice and solid instead of just sort of little metal tabs sticking out the back of the board. Um, and so this, this variant of the 8-pin power connector can actually handle easily in excess of 400 watts. Um, so basically with any CPU that you can stick into the socket, you don't have to worry about that. Like, you don't have to worry about the power connect, like the, the extra 4-pin power connector. Um, that's really there more to make you feel better about the power delivery on the motherboard rather than to actually do anything. It's actually kind of funny how if you go far back enough in time, uh, it wasn't that uncommon for, like, HEDT motherboards, which would run significantly power-hungrier CPUs than what we have right now, uh, only having a single 8-pin power connector. And not even using the high current uh, variant of the 8 pin power connector, which is honestly like, which, you know, looking back is honestly kind of concerning. But um, yeah, so these days, especially with 12th gen having the like solid metal, like solid pin 8 pin power connector, that's fine. Like, you don't need to worry about the extra 4 pin. Um, in fact, I've basically been like, all of I, I've not been bothering to plug in the extra 8-pin power connector during my 12900K testing. There's just absolutely no reason to do that. It makes no difference to overclocking. And, yeah, it's not like the connector's going to melt or anything. So, anyway, let's move on to the actual VRM itself. Um, and this is a rather standard, high, like, very cost-optimized Asus affair, which... Uh, might sound like an insult, but the thing is, um, this is just how Asus do uh, with their VRMs, uh, and it works fine. Like, you know, it, it's not like, like, they're cutting every corner that's that is totally okay to cut. Um, so what do I, well, well, we'll get into that. And most of it happens on, on this voltage regulator right here, but anyway, so we got VCC in down here. Uh, then the rest of this is, well, most of the rest of this is V-Core. Um, and that's a 7-phase V-Core, and I know it looks a hell of a lot like a 14-phase, but we'll get to that. Um, and then we have the iGPU rail over here, and that's a single phase. Um, and there's nothing weird going on with that, because, well, it's just one phase, and it looks like just one phase. So, 
that's the uh, sort of arrangement of the power rails on this board. Uh, the controller for vCore and iGPU is this chip over here. Um, and this is an ASP2100, and I have no idea who makes it, um, but I do know it's running in 7 plus 1 phase mode. Um, and the reason I have no idea who makes it is because this is one of those Asus rebranded Digi Plus uh, voltage controllers. And so it could be an Intersil, it could be an international rectifier, it could be a... I think rich tech is what they use on a lot of the really low end boards. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, it could be pretty much anything. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm like, I find that kind of annoying, but at the same time, I've also not really ever had an eight, like I've not tested an Asus motherboard that would do really badly in terms of voltage regulation. So I'm not particularly concerned about what flavor of rebranded voltage controller Asus decided to go with. Um, now then, it is running as a seven phase here, um, and so basically each phase um, is made up of, and I really need to figure out a better way to do that. And we, well, no, we can do it this way. Yeah, I can just crank up the spacing. So you have your phases split up like that, basically. All right, and like technically this this isn't anything. There's nothing there, but yeah. So, there's the phase splits in the VRM here. Um, and so the idea basically with how this works is that the voltage controller sends one PWM signal and that PWM signal goes to two power stages at the same time. Now the power stages do not share a switch node, but uh, for all intents and purposes, the inductors end up being in parallel and so you end up with one phase. Now the reason why you would do this is it costs less than having doublers, it costs less than having a 16 phase controller, which, you know, these days is actually a thing. Actually, it's a 20, well, no, you could get a 16 phase, you could get a 20 phase, there's lots of options, but um, this is cheaper, right? Like you can just buy a simpler, cheaper, set, uh, like the, this probably tops out as an eight phase controller, um, which is sort of where the reasonable voltage controllers stop, right? And from above, everything above that gets very expensive. Um, and so, um, yeah, so you get to use a cheaper controller and by putting the two power stages and inductors in parallel like this on with just with them sharing the PWM signal, uh, you basically double the current handling capacity uh, of that phase. Um, so yeah, like from a from the perspective of adding more power handling capacity, there's really no downs downsides to this. Like there's no oh this is going to be like significantly less less of, well it might be slightly less efficient than if you perfectly power current balanced every single phase individual at like every single power stage individually but that's really not necessary especially when you're using power stages as overkill as what asus has here um, as the power stages used are sic 659s which according to asus are nominally 80 amp our cave like our 80 amp power stages and i say nominally because uh, basically any power stage rated for more than like 35 amps is not realistically supposed to be run at its n nominal current rating because the, like technically if you have ex like enough cooling, and that's where the whole issue comes into, you can run a 60 amp power stage at 60, like you can run 60 amps through a 60 amp power stage. It's just that realistically you never want to do that because the efficiency will be absolutely horrible and it'll be producing a ton of heat and you're going to need an insane cooling system for it. And this is even more so uh, true of everything rated above 60 amps and sort of like at 35 amps the power stages like top out at reasonable heat outputs so you can kind of run 35 amps through a 35 amp power stage. The efficiency still isn't great but because they're not actually, you know, regulating that much power it's not that much heat that you have to deal with but when you're regulating you know when you're running 80 amps through a power stage even if the efficiency is like 85 percent uh that is a lot of heat um and so you know we and and the reason like and the, honestly this isn't even the most like extreme example of this there's 105 amp power stages now and it's just like yeah um you'll never run 105 amps through one of those in any reasonable operating scenario it's just not practical to do that um 
But anyway, these are still going to be extreme, like, the, the fact that they're nominally, like, so the nominal current rating is more like a performance class than it is an actual practical, hey, you can run 80 amps through each of the power stages in this VRM type of deal. Um, but these being nominally 80 amps does mean that they're going to be extremely efficient. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you really, like, so really, they're, especially with how many of them we have, it's, they're very overkill, so the whole concern of, like, perfectly current balancing your power, stage, st power stages, that's more of a concern when you're kind of on the edge of what they're able to handle, which this, mu like, which this VRM for an LGA 1700 CPU is just never going to be in that situation, so, yeah, this whole shoving one PWM signal into two power stages at the same time thing, uh, works great, like, as a means of cheaply increasing the current handling capacity of a VRM, it works really well, and it doesn't really introduce any major, like, yeah, it doesn't really introduce any downsides. Um, the one potential downside that you would have from having a lower phase count is that you'd have more input ripple, and the reason I say, I'm, I'm, like, not comfortable saying lower phase count is because seven phases is still a lot of phases, okay? Like, it's not that long ago that on a motherboard in this price class, Asus would have given you a four phase. So, by Asus motherboard standards, this is actually really, really good um, in terms of phase count, but the thing is, um, there are ways to compensate for the increased input ripple, and Asus has been doing that for ages because in the past they would do, you know, like, four-phase VRMs basically as standard for every motherboard they could, um, and aside of, and so the way you would compensate for that was to just have a lot more input filtering capacitors, and Asus is still doing that, so, yeah, because the thing with the extra input filtering capacitors is that they also are beneficial in, uh, in terms of improving the VRM's transient response, so it's kind of a situation of, like, well, we want the extra, like, you, you'd you want the extra input capacitance for transients, and then it also reduces the ripple, and so you don't, like, it'll also reduce the ripple if you're running a low phase count, so now you're less, you know, it's less necessary to run a high phase count VRM, um, and so uh, Asus VRMs generally have a lot of input capacitance, and then relatively low phase counts compared to their competitors. I'd like seven is not low. Like seven is a lot of phases. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just like, it's relatively low compared to the, like, cause we have the 390 motherboards going up to like 19 phase VRMs now. So actually even 20 phase VRMs. So, you know, relatively speaking, yes, it's kind of low. Practically speaking, a seven phase is a lot of freaking phases. Um, so, yeah, there's really, like, nothing to really complain about here, it's just kind of like, yeah, this is the cheaper way of getting really good performance out of your VRM. Um, you could argue that the really high phase count designs are kind of a brute force approach, but, um, at the end of the day, if it works, like, if, as a customer, it, like, I don't really, like, if you're buying a board, as long as it performs well, I don't really care what it costs the manufacturer to do, so... Yeah, anyway, um, so 7-phase V-Core, but with 14 power stages and 14 inductors to get the sort of same current handling capacity that you would see from a 14-phase. Um, and I guess it's also worth mentioning that because of the whole putting power stages in parallel thing, uh, Asus is using higher inductance inductors than what you see on uh, most, and yeah, uh, on most Z690 motherboards, as these are 470 nanohenries each, and the reason, and this is a really rather high inductance, like, for most motherboard, modern motherboards these days, it's standard to use, like, 200 nanohenries per phase, but the reason why Asus is using these really high inductance inductors is because when you put them in parallel, they effectively get much lower uh, inductance, because when both high side MOSFETs turn on, you have current ramping through this inductor and this inductor at the same time, so... Um, yeah, you actually want a higher inductance, um, to, well, mainly, again, reduce input ripple. Um, this, this actually is, honestly, like, you could get better transient re response with a lower inductance, but, uh, yeah, like, 235 nanohenries, which is what this effectively ends up being, due to the way this is set up, um, is actually a like a reasonable inductance for a modern motherboard, so it's not like it's not super weird that they're using 470s. 
Um, and also, I think they're just using, like, the, this probably is, like, a sweet spot inductance for a lot of the VRMs around the board, because you'll notice, like, the memory VRM uses the same inductor, the VCC in uses the same inductors, iGPU uses the same inductor, right? So, yeah, it's just kind of, like, you know, not super dialed in, but very cost-efficient if you can copy-paste the same inductor around the entire board. Um, which uh, you won't necessarily see with other manufacturers, though obviously Asus isn't the only ones to come up with this. Um, and also, I think the shoving one PWM line into two power stages at the same time was originally an MSI idea, but it's hard to trace who did it first. But like, I have at least one example of an MSI motherboard that's rather old that does this already. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's how the, the VRM is set up here. And also, actually... Speaking like but getting back to the inductors, the higher inductance actually improves the efficiency of the power stages a bit. Though um, normally the like significant part of that effect is somewhere between like like going from like a hundred nano henrys to maybe three hundred nano henrys, you'll see like a major improvement in efficiency because you reduce the RMS current going through each power stage. Um, but uh, once like four hundred and seventy nano henrys, I think is well into the realm of diminishing returns of of that effect. Um, and still, it is worth noting that does that does help a little bit with VRM efficiency. The potential downside to doing this is that higher inductance inductors generally will have higher DCR for a given physical size. Um, so, you know, you might be reducing the heat output of the power stage, but increasing the amount of heat being produced by the inductor by doing that. But, uh, in, like, when you've got 14 of them in parallel, that shouldn't really be, well, when you've got 14 inductors, that shouldn't really be a, too much of a concern, because each of the inductors is only handling 1 14th of the total current flowing through the VRM. Um, so, yeah, and generally speaking, inductors will have much less resistance to them than the actual, like, power MOSFETs within the power stages, so slightly increasing your DC, like the the resistance of the inductors to improve the efficiency of the power stages probably works out in, in Asus's favor. Anyway, um, let's talk about the theoretical VRM efficiency here. And this is going to be less accurate, like even less accurate than usual, um, because I can't actually get a public data sheet for these. Th thank you, Asus, for, <laughs> for using a bunch of parts that just don't have any public documentation. So um, these are made by Vishay Semiconductor, and in th this for like in this package size, the best power stage that I could find is the SIC645, which is a 60 amp part. Um, so not an 80 amp nominally, but I don't think there would be too much of a difference in the efficiency between the 645 and the the 659s, even though like nominally they have a higher current ratings, just because this is also the case for other manufacturers and their high current power stages where it's like you go from the, the 60 amp parts to the 90 amp parts and at least within the current ranges that you'd realistically care about, the difference is not much. Um, so, yeah, anyway. And the other issue is that the SIC645 documentation is spec'd for 180 nano Henry inductors, which is like a lot less than what Asus is using, so that's going to throw off the figures as well. Um, so basically, I think I'm going to be slightly overestimating the heat outputs of the MOSFETs and inductors here. Um, and we're also not accounting for any power losses in the power plane or the CPU socket itself, because there's not really any good way for me to know how much power you lose in the power plane or the CPU socket. So, anyway, let's get into it. So, 1.2 volts output voltage, 500 kilohertz switch, that is not a 5. Uh, 500 kilohertz switching frequency, which also it's worth noting that Asus likes to run their VRMs at 300 kilohertz, but the documentation is specced at 500, so... Um, yeah, like, I really think the efficiency figures that I'm going to be going with here are l definitely on the high side. I don't think by a significant amount, because even, like, really high-end power stages aren't gonna... Like, there's an upper limit to how efficient your VRM can be, and this is getting pretty close to that. Um, even with all of the, like, well, this would slightly improve efficiency, and that would slightly, like, slightly. Um, but yeah, that, that is something to keep in mind. So anyway... At 200 amps output current, uh, this VRM should produce a, probably less than 16 watts of heat, is the way I'm going to word that. 
At 300 amps output current, it should produce probably less than 26 watts of heat. Um, and so and we're going to put a less than in front of that. Though, again, I am not sure about that. And also, if you accounted for, like, power plane losses and socket losses, then it would actually, like, this would be less than the actual, like, total power loss getting to the CPU. But, um, yeah, I generally don't factor in the power plane. Even though, in some cases, that is actually a very important variable. Um, because sometimes you get motherboards that are like four layer that are four layers and the power plane ends up being the main bottleneck for VRM efficiency. Like overall, well, not really the VRM itself, but like overall power delivery efficiency. Um, and so instead of like the power stage is getting hot, the PCB itself just sort of starts getting hot. And that's a bit awkward, but yeah, you don't like you don't have to be concerned on that with, with that on this board. This is a six layer PCB, so yeah, anyway, 400 amps, um, and this, this is, so, if you're going to be overclocking, a, like, a 12900K, you're going to be in this current range right here, and, you know, 16 watts of, of heat at 200 amps out, output, that's a very good efficiency for the VRM, and then 300, uh, like, less than 26 watts of heat at 300 amps output, that's also really good efficiency. Now, at this point, you would actually, actually no, you can get away with, with this without airflow, right, because that is just about approaching two watts per power stage. And generally speaking, as a sort of general guesstimate, um, as long as you're not pushing more than two, like as long as each uh, each uh, sort of, yeah, power, well, most of the, like the inductors make some heat, most of it comes from the power stages. So as long as the power stages aren't producing much more than like two watts of heat, uh, you can, you really don't need much in the way of cooling. Like, you don't have to worry about airflow too much and that kind of thing. If you start going much, like, once you hit, like, 3 watts per power stage, that's when you start having to consider what kind of airflow do you have, is the VRM heatsink well designed, that kind of thing. And then once you get into, like, 4 watts or 5 watts of heat per power stage, that's when you, you're kind of looking at a situation of, like, yeah, you probably want to slap a fan directly on the VRM. Um... As uh, at that point, the like hoping for convection to cool your VRM doesn't tend to go too well. Anyway, so yeah, in the 200 to 300 amp range, which is where like a heavily overclocked 12900K will run, uh, and that's maxed out. Like if you're just playing games or something, you're going to be pulling even less current than that. But if you're running like Prime 95 or uh, well, Prime 95 Cinebench doesn't like Cinebench. Prime 95 pulls like 20 percent more current than Cinebench does, so we'll just go with Prime 95. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're, like, maxing out the load on your CPU, you're going to be in this current range, and the VRM will handle that just fine. So this 400 amp figure is more sort of just uh, for fun than it is for any real-world usage scenario. Um, and that, like, even, like, potentially if you wanted to take this motherboard on, L uh, on LN2... Um, like, the VRM would still have no problems with that, because the 12th gen CPUs actually scale really well with liquid nitrogen, so their power consumption doesn't get absolutely insane when on LN2. Um, so, anyway, 400 amps output, the VRM would produce less than about 40 watts of heat, and then 500 amps output, it should produce less than... Actually, I'm not sure at this point if it would be less than, like... With 500 amps output, the inductors might start being a major bottleneck, maybe. Um, but, okay, so we'll we'll put a roughly in the front of that. So, uh, what is that? There we go. Roughly 59 watts of heat. And ultimately, these are sort of, like, these are purely theoretical figures. There's not really any scenario where the motherboard will have to ever supply that much current to a 12, 12th gen CPU. And that includes liquid nitrogen overclocking, because on LN2... Uh, it is actually possible to get 12900Ks to pull in excess of, like, 400 watts of power, but they're doing it at much, much, much higher voltages than what you would be seeing during regular use. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be hitting 400 amps at 1.6 or 7 volts. Um, you're going to be hitting maybe, like, 300 amps at around 1.6, 1.7 volts, which is still a lot of power, right? That's that's over 400 watts of CPU power consumption, but it's not, like, you're still not hitting 400 amps. So, anyway, it's kind of that. It's also worth noting that on liquid nitrogen, people generally do not run Prime 95. Um, 
So, you know, that helps. Uh, so that's the vCore VRM. And, uh, oh, I guess the only thing I haven't talked about is the output filtering capacitors, which uh, we've got some through-hole polymers on the output. I don't know who makes these. If I had to guess, it's probably APAC, because APAC is... So for the high-end Asus motherboards, Asus tends to use uh, Nichicon capacitors, and for the lower-end boards, they use APAC uh, capacitors. I have no idea who makes these because these have like special Asus labeling on them, and so there's no branding on them, which is really, really, or at least there's no any there's no branding that I recognize. Either way, they are aluminum polymers rated for 5,000 hours at 105 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's true for all of the, like, black capacitors around the board. Um, and uh, if we go on to the back of the motherboard, we can see that in terms of voltage regulation, Asus has done some cost optimization to the CPU socket because they've just left out a bunch of the multilayer ceramic capacitors that they put pads in for. Uh, however, like I mentioned before, I've not actually had, like, I've not tested an Asus motherboard where the voltage regulation was, like, really, really bad. So I trust Asus to make like to that this doesn't really do anything except maybe increase the voltage overshoot slightly. And that might sound really bad, but the fun funny thing about voltage overshoot is it's a lot less of a problem than undershoot is. And uh, yeah, so like it looks ugly on the oscilloscope, but ultimately it doesn't cause blue screens and crashes and that kind of thing. So it doesn't really matter in my from my perspective. It's not like it's going to degrade your CPU unless it's extremely bad. And extremely bad overshoot is more a situation where you don't have enough bulk capacitance in general. It's not really going to be significantly affected by how many multilayer ceramics are on the back of the socket. That's not really what these are for. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not very... So, I mean, this is a $300 motherboard, so I, I think they could have paid for the couple extra multilayer ceramic capacity, like, you know... I don't think it was necessary to remove the multilayer ceramics from the back of the board. At the same time, I don't think it necessarily makes that much of a difference. Um, so, yeah. Um, though, ideally, you'd want to check with an oscilloscope. Unfortunately, I don't have a... Uh, for Z690, I don't yet have a method of doing that. That wouldn't be biased towards certain motherboard designs. Mainly motherboards that don't, you know empty the back of the CPU socket. So, um, yeah. So it wouldn't really be fair for me to, like, measure this motherboard and compare it against some of the other Z690 motherboards I have because the other ones have a lot more capacitance on the back of the socket, and that would probably lead to them, like, overperforming relative to what's actually happening at the, like, CPU level because, obviously, uh, what matters is the voltage regulation at the CPU, not so much what happens on the back of the motherboard. Um... Anyway, so yeah, that's the that's the vCore VRM on here, and like yes, there's a lot of cost optimization here, but nothing that would actually harm the performance of the VRM or negatively impact uh, overclocking from anything that I can immediately see. I mean, the lack of multilayer ceramics on the back of the socket is kind of like that might slightly r make voltage regulation a little bit worse, but I really. Like, from my past experience with Asus motherboards, I'd be very, very surprised if Asus didn't know exactly what they were doing when they removed those. I don't think it was just like, oh yeah, we're, we're just gonna remove these to save a couple cents and, you know, it's gonna screw over overclocking. That's not what they do. Um, anyway, like, they still did it to save a couple cents, but they, they're they full, like, they know what, what the side effects of it are going to be. Um, anyway... Um, let's move on to, well, I guess the iGPU rail is worth mentioning, that just uses another SICK, uh, 659, and, uh, yeah, that, that just kind of exists. Um, I don't know how much power the iGPU needs, I also don't really care. As far as I know, most people just use it for video encoding, and I don't believe that even loads the entire G iGPU core, so, yeah, you don't really have to be too worried about that. Um, and then the VCC and rail. So here we have like extreme cost optimization, at least compared to most other manufacturers in this price range. Um, because most other manufacturers, at least as far as I'm aware, well, I'm not sure about ASRock, but MSI and Gigabyte both use smart power stages for their VCC and rail. Um, Asus over here is using a high side MOSFET, a low side MOSFET, and another high side MOSFET, and another low side MOSFET, two inductors, and these are all connected in, like, one big blob together, so 
that, yeah, like th this is all just connected together um, because that is the cheapest way to implement a high enough current VCC in VRM. Um, so the MOSFETs in use here are the 4C10B. So 4C10B, and this is a on semiconductor MOSFET. This is a like ASUS specific variant of the 4C10N. Uh, the 4C10N is kind of the absolute bare minimum of MOSFETs that you will generally see on a motherboard. And then the low side FETs are 4C06 and uh, 6Bs, which is the exact same situation. This is like, you're not gonna... Actually, no, it's not true that you won't find motherboards with worse low side MOSFETs on them, but these are like second to the bottom on the list of MOSFETs that I've encountered on at least motherboards from manufacturers whose names you would generally recognize, right? So, yeah, these aren't, like, neither of these MOSFETs is particularly great. Um, if these were being used in vCore, I would be very upset about that. But they're not on vCore, they're on VCC in. And VCC in is a low, like, relatively low power rail. It outputs 1.8 1, 1 volts, so the amount of current that it needs to put, provide to the CPU is rather low. And so it makes perfect... Like, honestly, I'm surprised that so many other manufacturers use smart power stages for VCC in. Because, um, yeah, like, this, this makes perfect sense. Like, it's not a high power rail. You don't need a crazy high efficiency on it. Like, ultimately, the, like, the VR, the operating temperature of this is going to be more dependent on the operating temperature of the V-Core than it is on, on itself. Um, like, yeah, th this, this is totally sensible. It is still very much, much cheaper than what you see on most other, uh, Z690 motherboards in this price range, but there's no downsides to doing this. It's just kind of like, yep, Asus cost optimization at work. And the controller over here is a NCP... 81270, uh, and that is a single phase uh, controller from On Semiconductor with integrated gate drive. So it drives the MOSFETs directly. There's no driver IC, which makes sense. Like you, you wouldn't need a driver. Like you wouldn't use a drive dedicate. Like you wouldn't use a controller that needs a separate driver IC in this kind of situation. Like single phase controllers with built-in drivers, or even you can get even up to I think like four phases. Four, yeah, four phase. Uh, controllers with all of the drive uh, circuitry built directly into them. Um, so, yeah, this makes perfect sense. And then we have two more, you know, two more of the same inductors that we have for V-Core because, like, we're, we, like, Asus already bought, like, 15 of them for the iGPU and V-Core. Why would you buy a different inductor? Though it is worth noting that um, since these all share, like, these are all connected together, um, what you could do with this motherboard, not that you should do that, uh, you could remove both of these inductors and replace them with a inductor of equivalent uh, specs, and the motherboard would run just fine. So basically, if you found a 235 nanohenry inductor with the same uh, saturation current and uh, like DC resistance, you could replace these two inductors with one inductor, it wouldn't make a difference. Now, the reason Asus didn't use one inductor is because they're already using these 470 nanohenry inductors everywhere else, so it's just cheaper to keep using those instead of, you know, like ordering a specific inductor just for that one rail. Um, anyway, so nothing really to complain about with VCC in. Like, I, I'm i not, like, I, you know, as much as I've been kind of, com like, these aren't great, like, as much as I've said, like, these aren't great MOSFETs. The thing is, VCC and really doesn't need to provide the CPU that much current, and so I'm not even bothered to calculate what kind of efficiency this VRM would get. Um, though it is worth noting, I am much better at calculating MOS, like, well, yeah, for something like this, the ac calculation would be more accurate, but also it's just kind of like, eh, less important. Um, anyway, uh, I guess we could also mention the memory power, which is sort of like half a VCC in. And now nah, it's more like two, th it's more like three fourths of a VCC in. Um, and no, okay, it's not kind of two thirds maybe. So you've got your inductor, of course, and then you've got a high side MOSFET and then two low side MOSFETs, and it's the same set of MOSFETs again. And the controller is, I believe, this chip over here, and I didn't write down what it is. Good job, me. So yeah, but that's gonna have integrated gate drive again. Um, so. Anyway, that's the memory power.
Now let's talk about, I guess, the memory topology. So this board uses a, like, as I mentioned earlier, this is a six layer PCV. We've got a daisy chain topology and it's not shielded. Um, or, well, yeah, eh, okay, it's, that's, it's, it's not, that, not quite that simple. So the back of the board, um, that is shielded, right? You can't see um, the other memory channel. And by the other memory channel, I mean channel B. Yeah, so you can't see channel B because channel B goes to these two DIMM slots and that is internal to the motherboard, so you can't see any of the traces, uh, traces for that. The A channel, however, is just sort of running on the very top layer of the board. Um, and uh, I don't know if this has any ne like negative side effects because so far this board has been the easiest when it comes to memory overclocking for me to work with. Um, out of all the DDR4Z690s that I've used, now I've not tested it for like high frequency DDR4, um, so I've not gone, like I've not used gear 2 at all, and generally speaking it's high memory speeds where the memory topology makes more of a difference than at low memory speeds. But the thing is, if you're going to be getting a, a 12th gen CPU with DDR4, you're probably going to want to run dual rank Samsung VDI in gear 1, and so who cares about the gear 2 performance? I don't, that's why I didn't test it. <laughs> So, you know, it's like if you're going to be running gear, gear 2, you should be going DDR5. And if you want to run gear 1, well, you get DDR4. Like, if you're on DDR4, you're going to be in gear 1. Um, and so, yeah, I am not really all that concerned about the fact that I have no idea how this performs at, like, high memory speeds. Because why would you run that? It's a DDR4 motherboard. Run it in gear 1. Um, and in gear one, it's really well behaved. I've had, uh, so on this chat, on the outer channel, and the thing is like, so the outer channel, I've had that boot up to 4,200 on single rank. Um, and a little, I think it did, I've not tested it specifically with dual, dual rank. Um, and the inner channel maxes out for me at like 4080, uh, for single rank memory sticks. Um, and, you know, that might be down to the way the topology is designed, but I think it's more likely that it's down to the memory controller, because I've seen basically the same behavior from every motherboard I've tested, um, where the outer two DIMM slots are just slightly better than the inner two DIMM slots, which actually it's not even the inner two DIMM slots, you just shouldn't use, like, it's a daisy chain topology, you should just not use that extra DIMM slot. <laughs> Like, this is this extra DIMM slot is for people who need 64, and actually, no, if you need 64 gigs of RAM, do, you probably still don't want to use that DIMM slot. If you, you want, that DIMM slot is for people who need 128 gigs of RAM, um, which, if you're going to be running that on DDR4, your memory stress test is going to take forever. It's going to take so damn long. Um, but, yeah. Anyway, so, basically, this slot does up to 4080 for me. And I think that's down to the limits of the memory controller. And this is like bootable. This is not remotely stable. And then 4200 uh, on the outer one. Uh, in dual rank, I've had the board top out at, at like with at 3900, limited again by this dim slot. And uh, yeah, that's just a limitation of my memory controller. I've think like I've seen screenshots of boards with this memory topology doing 4000. Um, so yeah, my 12900K's memory controller is just kind of not great in gear one for DDR4. Um, and, but the board is really well behaved. Like unlike some, some of the other Z690s I've tested, you don't have to worry about your termination resistances. You don't have to worry about RTLs. You don't have to worry about really much of anything. Um, with some of the other boards, there's a bunch of hoops to jump through to get 39, like for me to get 3900 working. Uh, on this board, you just kind of set it to 3900, you punch in your timings, and set your voltages. That's it. You don't have to do anything weird with training voltages or any anything like that. So, um, yeah, the memory overclocking behavior on this board is, um, well, what it should be, right? <laughs> like, honestly, I think the other Z690 motherboards are getting, like, the, the other Z690 motherboards, you can very clearly tell that the BIOSes aren't dialed in yet. Whereas this one... Um, like, it has, this one works as expected. Um, at the same time, I've not had it, like, it, like per, run better settings than any of the other boards, so it's not like this motherboard performs better, it's just kind of easier to set up than everything else I've been working with so far for DDR4. So, yeah, that's the, uh, Z690 
uh, tough, no, tough gaming Z690 dash plus D4 motherboard from Asus. Um, I still think that at $300, it's kind of too expensive. Because, yeah, like it, yeah, I, I still think it's kind of too expensive. But if you think $300 is fine for the features that this offers, knock yourself out. I'm not like, it's it's a perfectly good motherboard. I just think it's a bit overpriced. I think if it was, well, actually, there, there's two ways. There's two ways Asus could have fixed this in my eyes. The LEDs could have been a postcode and then I'd forgive every other issue I have with this motherboard. Or they could have added the two SATA ports and two more USB. Actually, I don't think that would justify $300 yet. I think they'd have to lower the price a bit, like 250 maybe, yeah. If it was like 250 I wouldn't have a problem with it, but it's $300, and that's kind of a lot. Um, and the board doesn't really do that much, right? Like, the VRM's nice, but it's 12th gen. You don't need that much VRM anymore. Um, like, this is well into overkill territory. So, yeah. That's into... or. Okay, no, this is not... Compared to some of the other Z690 boards, this is not well into overkill territory, but... Yeah, um... Like, you can you can get away with significantly less than this. Um, so... Yeah, I, I don't... Like... I, I wouldn't prior... Like, I wouldn't buy the motherboard for the VRM. Maybe for the memory overclocking, or maybe for the dual type Cs. Um, and... Again, the thing is, the memory overclocking, I think, is a temporary advantage for this board, because I really think it's just a matter of the other manufacturers getting their BIOSes together. And once that's done, then, at least from what I've experienced so far, all of the Z690 DDR4 boards clock roughly the same. So, and at that point, again, it's like, I just think it's a bit overpriced. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. as like, perfectly acceptable motherboard with a kind of un unacceptable price tag. So, yeah, especially considering all the cost optimization does Asus does to their VRM. So, anyway, uh, that's it for the PCB breakdown. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. Both Patreon and Teespring help out immensely with running the channel, so it would be much appreciated if, you, if you'd check them out. And uh, that's it for the video, so thank you for watching, and goodbye!